Okay. Good afternoon or good evening to everyone. We are I ladies Urmia. Welcome to the webinar. Today's webinar as a, a guide for building to building the your first neural uh, network. We are pleasure to the house of Christine Hunter as a from Harvard University. She is the PhD student in statistical department and have experiences as a statistical um, software engineering, data analyst, and uh, also have experience in teachings, meta-analysis, as I think. And my name is Nagme Pakwar, uh, researcher in the Center of Ecological uh, Research in, uh, in Hungarian and uh, member of the Our Ladies Urumia. Uh, I would really like to know uh, uh, all of you, uh, for, uh, where are you from, but, um, which city or uh, country or university, please keep writing the cities and country or univer your university on the chat. And if you, um, you have any questions or uh, wanted to be presenter, le uh, let me know us uh, uh, and message to us on the chat. Uh, today we will uh, have a very um, advanced talking in my opinions and I'm very curious to know uh, to hear about uh, these topics more. I'm not taking your time uh, anymore. Um, uh, floor is yours, uh, Christine. Uh, I will be still here and when you're done, I started Q sessions. Good luck. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about um, building your first neural network. Uh, so thank you all for, for joining me um, today. And feel free to interrupt at any point with um, questions that you have. You can um, you know, just shout out, raise your hand, whatever you want. Um, definitely feel free. Um, I first want to talk about like what the goals of this talk are. Um, so I'm going to introduce some background, like, and sort of on fun foundational concepts in machine learning and in predictive models. Um, so I want to try to make this accessible to everyone. Um, and because of that, if you already have done like any, pretty much any predictive modeling or machine learning, um, some of these topics might be um, very like review for you. Um, so I just want to like clarify that this is really for like an introductory talk. Um, and if you're already like, I fit some neural networks, like you'll probably get a little bit bored. <laughs> um, so my second goal is to talk about um, some of the conceptual background of neural networks specifically. And then um, finally, I'll fit some very simple neural, neural networks um, in R. Um, and then part two is just like, for just kind of for fun as a completely unrelated topic is I, I just want to briefly go over some of the tools that are built into RStudio for debugging and profiling code, um, because I think that they're really powerful and that like, I'm always surprised at like how few data scientists actually know about them and use them. Um, so I just wanna like introduce them to people who haven't seen them before. Um, and then the slides, let me put this in the chat. The slides are available online if you wanted to like follow along or um, download them later, um, so. Uh, and it, it's available both as an HTML file, but also as an R presentation. So if you want to like open it up in R and like look at the code, you can. Okay. So to start off, let's talk about what neural networks are. So what is a neural network? Um, okay, so what is a neural network? Um, it's a predictive machine learning algorithm. So it takes in inputs um, and depending on what field you're in, this has different names. So you might call them features, predictors, covariates, variables, um, you know, information about say a person or something else. And then it outputs a prediction, right? So there are two different um, goals that we can do with neural networks. They work for both classification and regression. So classification is when we want to predict a category, like the color of the pixel or a person's political party. And then regression is when we want to predict a number like um, temperature or a stock price. Um, and neural networks are an example of supervised machine learning. Um, so this might be a term that you've heard before and I think it's just um, often not really like explained. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that I explain it. Um, so supervised machine learning is when you give the algorithm um, a set of inputs with known outputs or sometimes called labels. So you say, this person has this political party. This pixel is blue. 
Um, and then you train the network to identify like future um, things. So you say, okay, this pixel was blue, but please, I don't know what color this, this other pixel is. Please tell me what it is. So this thing, the supervised machine learning includes neural networks, regression, support vector machines, random forests, um, and a lot of other um, algorithms. So for example, you might give it um, pictures and you say, okay, this is a dog, this is a cat, and this is a dog. And then you give it a new picture and you ask it, is it a dog or is it a cat? Unsupervised machine learning is when you don't um, give it any known outputs or labels. Um, and examples of these type of algorithms include clustering and principal components analysis. So in this case, the algorithm, all you do is you give it the pictures and then the algorithm tells you, okay, these two pictures are in the same category. I don't know what that category is because you haven't told me anything about it, but I know that they're in the same category versus this picture is in a separate category. And if you were to give it a new picture, it would tell you is it category one or category two. Um, so neural networks fit into the supervised machine learning category. Um, so you can, you know, uh, you, you have to like train it with known data and then it will, will give you information, like predict what um, new data is going to be. So that's um, the category of like sort of what we're interested in doing. Um, and now I want to talk about like how neural networks work at like a pretty like um, simple levels. So there's like, obviously it's like a really complicated thing um, and I'm not going to go into like a lot of details, um, but just to sort of give you an overview of like where it was the motivation is. So neural networks, right, the neural part is that it's modeled based on um, neurons in the brain. Um, so a very simple way about thinking about neurons is, is that they are either on or off. And whether they are on or off depends on how much input they receive. Um, so, you know, all your neurons are connected to each other. Um, and then one will like send an, uh, send an input to another neuron. And if that input reaches a certain threshold, then the neuron fires. Uh, but if it's below that threshold, the neuron does not fire. So it's like, it's you sort of like, if you have increasing input, it's like, it's off, it's off, it's off. And then you hit a certain threshold and then the neuron fires and it's on. We can model this mathematically using a step function. Um, so here the y-axis is, is the neuron on or off? So over here, zero is off and one is on. And the x-axis is our inputs. Um, so in this case, if the input is negative, the neuron is off. And if the input is positive, the neuron is on. Um, and this is called an activation function. Um, it kind of is called that because it you know, tells you whether or not the neuron is active. And if the neuron is active, that means it passes along its signal down downstream, right? It's gonna, like if one neuron fires then it passes it along to the next neuron. So a perceptron is a single node in a neural network. Um, so perceptron is like the mathematical version of a single neuron in your brain. And the way a perceptron works is it takes all your inputs. So this is all your um, you know, information about yourself, my favorite color, my income, where I live, et cetera. Um, it takes all that, those inputs. Um, it has a bunch of weights associated with them. So um, maybe my income is weighted more highly than my favorite color. It sums them all together. It puts them into the activation function. So like into my step function, and then it gives you an output. Um, so if, you know, if this sum goes into the activation function and it hits the needed threshold, then this perceptron fires, it's activated or on. Um, this, the step function is um, a very like simple way of modeling neurons as being on or off, but we might want to be a little bit more flexible and say like my neuron is like partially on or partially off. Um, so this is sort of a fuzzier, more flexible activation function. So instead of being strictly on or off, it's saying like maybe over here my neurons uh, like at a low level, here it's like half on, mostly on, and then once you hit a certain threshold, it's like it does max out at a certain point. Um, so this is kind of the, the strength of the signal. Instead of being on or off, it's like stronger or less strong. Um, and common functions for this are like logistic functions or any other sigmoidal functions that have this nice like S shape. So that's how a single uh, perceptron works. 
Um, but the, of course, the second half of neural networks is the fact that it's a network, right? So we have a bunch of connections between these different things. So we usually think about sort of three different categories of layers. The input layer is those features, your covariates, all that information. Then those feed into what's known as the hidden layer, and that's where all my perceptrons are that have all their activation functions that decide whether or not they're on or off. And then finally, the output layer is our predictions. So um, if I were predicting colors, then this, um, this node would be red and this node would be green. Um, if I'm predicting numbers, then I'd have a lot more nodes and each one would correspond to like a unique number value, whether that's like income or stock price or something like that. Um, and this, this is a simplification that assumes there's only one hidden layer. You can also have neural networks with like many, many different hidden layers, but they're all sort of like grouped in the same. It's just like a giant network of perceptrons that are all interacting with each other. So how do we train a neural network? Um, if you've trained a predictive model um, before, this is sort of the just like the basic background on how you usually do that. Um, so we usually split data into two sets, a training set and a test set. Um, during the training stage, that's when we like fit the model, and that's how we determine the optimal weights given the data that you gave it. So remember that um, in our perceptron, um, each covariate has a certain weight, and in the training phase, that's how you determine what the weights should be in order to get the best outcome. Um, that process, the training of a neural network, is like very complicated and way beyond my understanding, um, and that it, it's the reason that neural networks are actually very slow to fit often um, because it's this like very iterative process where you start off with like a random set of weights and then you iterate to like try to improve them and you keep on iterating until you get the best weights possible to get um, accurate predictions. Um, so after the training stage, the model is basically specified by what, what, weight, what weights you have. And then in the test stage, we apply um, the model to unseen data to see how well we did. So we, we you know, try to predict Hey, what color are all these pixels? And then we compare it to what the color that the pixels actually are. And then it um, we can evaluate how well we did. And the reason that we do this, this split is to um, reduce the um, the, uh, the reduce the possibility of overfitting. So overfitting happens when you really specifically fit a model to the data that you've seen. And then when you have new data, it doesn't perform as well on new data. So in this example, we have, um, we're trying to figure out the, the like boundary between red dots and blue dots. Um, and the green line is overfitting. So it's perfectly determining like all of the blue dots are together and all of the red dots are together. Um, but the black line is not overfit. So the problem with the green line is like, let's say I had a new dot that was red and it was like over here. Um, the green line would, would say that it should be blue when actually it's red, right? Um, and the versus the black line would, would act accurately, um, accurately like quantify that. So um, there's sort of this balance where the more precise your model is, then the more risk there is that you overfit. So for example, let's say you have um, a model and you're trying to predict um, someone's income, right? And you have a single person in your data set and their favorite color is purple. And you tell the model, hey, this person's favorite color is purple and they have like a super high income. So overfitting would say, hey, I'm gonna predict um, income based on someone's favorite color. And I'm gonna say every single time someone has a favorite color purple, they have a super high income. Now that's probably not accurate, right? That's probably just like happenstance that the person we happen to see in a training set um, had like this correlation when it's not real. So that's like an example of overfitting. What you really want the model to say is like, your favorite color is not at all related to what income you have most likely. Um, so when do you, should you use a neural network? Um, the advantages of neural networks, it's great that they work for both classification and regression. So um, some, a lot of algorithms maybe only work for one or the other, but um, you don't have to like modify neural network, it works either way. 
um, they tend to have very predictive, good performance. So that's why people like them. They work really well. Even when you have like really complicated problems like image recognition, um, it's like notoriously hard for computers to figure out like what's a dog and what's a cat, and, like very easy for humans to do so, right? But like neural networks are like what drive a lot of those kind of um, algorithms. And the reason they work so well is because they can approximate almost any function, including really complex nonlinear functions. So this is the distinction from say linear regression, which is like the classic um, statistical model that we like often default to, which is a great, um, which is a great algorithm, but like assumes a very simple linear relationship versus neural networks can fit like sort of any complex function. The disadvantage of neural networks is because they're so flexible, that's like a double-edged sword. And that means that they're also very prone to overfitting. So they're much more likely to overfit than some other algorithms. You also have to choose, uh, make some choices, um, which is always just kind of annoying. Um, so you have to choose how many nodes you want and how many layers you want. Um, and so that means that, you know, two different people, if they choose a different number of nodes and layers, they're gonna have different algorithms. Um, of course, there's principled ways to choose those things, which I'll talk about later, but they tend to be very computationally intensive. Neural networks are um, in general uh, computationally intensive. They take a long time, lots of memory, very slow. Um, if you're just like running a normal algorithm on like sort of a normal set of data, like it's fine, you can run it on your computer. Um, but uh, it's once you get into big data sets, it's much more computationally intensive than say running a regression. And so you probably have to be like run it on cloud computing. And I would say personally, the main problem with neural networks is the fact that they give you like no insight into what's happening in your data. So it's a black box model you give it inputs, it gives you outputs, and you have like absolutely no idea where those outputs came from, right? You have like, if you look at a regression, it tells you, hey, there's like this high correlation between this and this, and it's positive or negative. And neural networks, you have like no idea like what drove those predictions. You don't know why certain predictions were high and certain predictions were low, for example. So just a brief history of neural networks, because I think it's kind of, um, it's a kind of a fun thing to, to know about. Um, in the 50s is sort of when they first came around and that's when the perceptron algorithm was first invented. Um, so at the time um, they weren't networks, it was just thinking about single perceptrons, a single node with an activation function. In the 60s and 70s, people started playing with the perceptron algorithm more, um, but they actually decided it wasn't very useful um, because if you only have a single node, you can't model even a really simple function if it's not linear. Um, so there's like, it's really easy to like break sort of single perceptrons. So people were like, actually, this is like not a useful thing. Let's, let's ignore it for now. Um, but then in the 80s, that's when people started uh, coming up with the idea of actually doing networks. So like multi-layer perceptrons. And that completely solved the problem of single perceptrons. Um, so once you have multi-layers, that's what allows you to have um, really complicated functions. Um, and so like neural networks became really popular again in the 80s and people started doing research on them again. And then in the 90s, sort of the size of data exceeded the computational power that we had. And neural networks, because they're so intensive, um, they didn't scale well to the size of the data that was being produced. So they, again, became unpopular. So it's sort of this like up and down trend. Um, and instead, everyone was like, I want to do research on support vector machines. Those, those are the new, the new big thing, not neural networks. But finally, the 2000s is when they like really came back into popularity um, because the computational power sort of like caught up with neural networks. Um, and this is also when um, deep learning was introduced. So if you've heard the term deep learning, and you're like, what is deep learning? What is this thing that everyone talking about? Um, now you actually know, because deep learning is just a complicated neural network that has a lot of hidden layers. Um, so the one that I introduced has you know, one hidden layer, but you could have a deep learning, like a, a neural network with hundreds or thousands of hidden layers. Um, and that's what like deep learning is. I don't know if there's like a specific threshold that's like, this is the difference between like a deep neural network or not, but really, really just a fancy name for uh, a neural network. 
Um, and so uh, from the 2010s until today, neural networks continue to be very popular, lots of research in them, um, and like they're just very successful algorithms. They drive um, a lot of the like innovations that we've seen um, by big companies like Google and things like that, and like um, image rec recognition and a lot of different fields. So this is just a joke from the XKCD comic that um, no one really understands machine learning methods. Um, so if you're if you're like confused, so is everyone else in the world. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna now move on to like actually fitting some neural networks. So here is a um, the data I'm going to be using is um, there's a relatively new package on CRAN called Palmer Penguins, and it has this data set on penguins, which is very cute. Um, so we have the species of penguin, the island where it was located, and then a bunch of measurements about the penguin, um, the length of their bill and the depth of their bill and a, and a few other things that I'm not doing here. Um, and our goal is we're going to try to predict the species of penguin based on their um, measurements. So um, I just do a little bit of pre-processing. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into a lot of detail. Like this code is available. There's just like some annoying things that I had to do to like make this, this code work. Um, one thing that's really important when you're doing most machine learning algorithms is to normalize the data. Um, so if you have um, variables on very different scales, for example, maybe you have one variable that's income and the next variable is how many children children you have. Um, those are vastly different scales, right? And because neural networks are all about figuring out weights, if you have different scales, it's going to give a really high weight to the variables with a bigger scale. So like the income is going to have a higher weight, even though that variable isn't necessarily more important. So instead, we normalize everything. So that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. They're all on the same footing. Um, and then those weights actually become much more accurate and meaningful. Um, then I split it into my training and testing sets. And then um, the first package I want to introduce is the NNet package. Um, so you tell it a formula um, for your model. So I, I'm predicting species based on all of these variables, bill length, depth, and flipper length, and body mass. Um, I also included sex, even though we know that sex like doesn't um, predict the species, but it might interact with these other variables in important ways, right? So it might be that, um, you know, male penguins of a certain species have a certain bill length, right? And neural networks handle interactions really well. Um, so this is something that I like might want to include. It might not be important, but like it doesn't hurt. So I feed in the data, the formula, and then the size is the number of hidden nodes that I want. I just sort of chose an arbitrary um, value. Um, one rule of thumb people use is that the hidden nodes is like having the number of the hidden nodes be the number of variables you have is like roughly an okay place to start. And then you get predictions. So my first um, penguin, I think it's a 57% chance of being an Adeli penguin, a 42% chance of being a Chinstrap penguin, and I don't think it's a Gen 2 penguin. Versus some of the other penguins, I'm like super confident um, they have a one probability of one, for example, being an Adeli penguin. Another package is called the neural net package package. There's a bunch of different packages. Um, just the main thing that I want to take away from this is that the neural net package requires a wholly different type of data setup. So it's very annoying. Um, the previous one wanted a factor variable. Um, this one wants a dummy variable for um, like three different columns, each with like a one or zero specifying which species it's at. Um, but then after you do that, it's pretty much like similar. You give it the data, the number of hidden nodes, et cetera, and then it gives you predictions. Um, the, the cool thing about this package is that it gives you this built-in network visualization. Um, it's kind of fun, but also useless. <laughs> um, you can see that like I only have a few variables and it's already like basically incomprehensible, right? So you can imagine that if you had a more complicated neural network, this is like not at all useful. Um, so these are the weights 
here. So this is like the weight of bill length for this perceptron is 258 versus for this perceptron, it's negative. Um, people are, are trying to come up with ways to sort of like interpret what these hidden nodes mean, um, but that's like really, really hard to do. So it's basically not really worth doing. Um, and then again, these sort of these perceptrons combine um, to be, to give you your outputs. So this is kind of fun, but again, not, not super useful. Um, I do want to clarify um, something about, like I talked about um, how like neural networks are not interpretable and like this is not really helping with that, um, but there is a lot of research into that area now. So um, people are working on making models more understandable and like really getting insights into how they're working. Um, that's like an active area of research. Uh, the final um, package is the one that I actually like really want to recommend you use, um, which is the tidy models package in combined with the parsnip package. This is a, a, a pretty new package. Um, I think they just like sort of finalized version one pretty recently. Um, it was like in beta mode before. Um, and the really cool thing about the tidy models package, um, first of all, it's like in the tidyverse framework, obviously. So if, you, if you're like a tidyverse person, that's um, it like, you know, your brain might work that way better. But the, the really powerful thing about it is that um, it takes in a single like type of data format and then it allows you to apply a bunch of different models. So what used to be true is like, let's say I wanted to try fitting a random forest, a neural network, a regression, and a support vector machine all on the same data and I wanted to compare how they all did. Well, every package would have its own unique syntax and data structure and so you have to like massage the data for like every single thing, one of those and like you like the predictions would all come out in different formats and it was like super annoying. But tiny models, it allows you to have a single um, like single format that works for everything. Um, so here, first I give it the model specification. This is multi-layer perceptron, so that's a neural network. I tell it what underlying engine to use. So this is actually using the NNet package that I already introduced under the hood to fit the neural network. Um, there are also other engines. The main difference between the packages is how they do the training. So there's a bunch of different algorithms that do neural training. Um, I honestly don't think it makes a huge difference, but like some of them are faster or slower, or more optimal for certain contexts. So if you're like really, really like getting into details, it might matter, but I think for most people, like you can kind of just pick an arbitrary engine. And then you also tell it, hey, I want to do classification instead of regression. And then once I've told it my model specification, so this part is where I actually fit my model. I feed my model specification into a model fitting process. I specify my X is my predictors, my Y is my output. And this part of the code is exactly the same no matter what type of model I had. So if I wanted to change this to be a random forest or a linear regression, this would all be the same. And I wouldn't have to reformat my data. I don't have to like change the formula type or anything like that. Um, so that's really, really nice about tidy models. And then the final step I want to do is um, evaluate how well I did. Um, and again, this is one of the cool things about tidy models is that no matter what kind of model, you're always going to get like the same um, structure of output versus before you get like predictions in all sorts of different ways. Um, so I, I tell it to predict um, based on my model. I'm going to just predict it on the training data first. So I'm going to say like, hey, which, which type of penguin do you think everything is? And then I compare it to the actual true values of all the penguins. Uh, the only annoying thing that I had to do here is that um, I had to re-sort the order because the parsnip package like changes the order of the columns to be alphabetical. And so otherwise they're not, um, they don't match. Um, but basically, yeah, that's all this code is doing is that it's like um, getting the predictions, the predicted species, and then comparing them to the actual species and then calculating the accuracy. Um, this data set was actually probably like a poor example for a neural network because it's too easy, right? So the training accuracy is like really, really high. I got almost all the penguins right. Um, I don't have the code here because it's the same, but um, you also like really the thing that we want to evaluate is the accuracy on the test set um, because that's like brand new data we've never seen before. That's much more representative of, um, you know, what like how it actually work in the real world. Um, usually you see a drop in test accuracy, usually it's like harder to predict on that. Um, if there's a really big drop, that's a sign of um, overfitting. Here, because the problem is so easy, um, it's basically like very similar accuracy on both, but this is like not what usually happens. It's just that 
again, the, predicting the Tangan type was, was very simple. <laughs> Um, I want to, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip talking about cross validation. Um, it's a method for um, deciding how many hidden nodes that you might want to have. I sort of arbitrarily picked five, but that's not necessarily the, um, the number that we want. Um, but of course, like I have a bunch of code on like that will be in the slides online if you want to follow along. Um, a lot of packages do cross validation for you. Um, but I just wanted to like include the code in case you wanted to like understand it. You know, I often like don't understand the concept until I like see the actual code and not just like a function that does it for me. Um, but like in reality, you probably have a package to for you. Um, but basically I did cross validation um, and it actually told me I should only have three hidden nodes. So this is like the neural network that it, it recommended instead of the one that I had. Um, it probably doesn't make a huge difference in this case because my accuracy was already so high, but maybe my accuracy goes to like 100% instead of 98% because I, I chose the proper number of notes. So the second part of the talk, um, I just wanna briefly talk about using debugging and profiling tools. And I'm gonna to switch to a live demo for this. So let me pull it up. So um, what I'm going to do is I go to, no, let me get out of full screen mode briefly. I go to um, debug and then in this, can you see what I'm doing right now? I just want to make sure you can see. Yes, where yes you can see. Okay. So, um, the default debug mode is that when your code has an error, it, it tells you a message, right? So I'm, I'm gonna run this code that has an error in it, right? And this, this code is very simple. It's a function that takes in X. If X is greater than zero, it says hello, and otherwise it says goodbye. And then I tell it to feed in X is log of negative one, which is a, not a number. And so when I, you know, I run it and it's like error, I don't know what to do. So if you wanna go into debug mode, you instead change it to break in code. And now if I resource this file, one thing it does is it highlights, hey, this is where the error happened. Um, so that's really useful. And then it also puts me into this debugger tool where I can play around with what things are. So I can say like, what is the value of X? I'm like, oh, it's an and. Like, well, of course that was like the problem. But it doesn't necessarily, you know, without going into this, it's like hard to, hard to tell what's going on. Um, and then I can, um, if I want to get out of it, I just press stop. So this is like a very, sim very simple version of um, what, like how we might want to use this. Um, if there's anything that you remember about debugging, it's this function called recover. So the debugging is that sometimes the, the line that the, code breaks on is like some internal R function that like you don't understand, right? Like you'll, you'll, you'll get in debug mode and it'll be like, I broke on a line that looks like, like this. And you're like, I have absolutely no idea what's going on, right? That's not helpful. Um, what recover does is it allows you to choose what level of code that you wanna step into, right? So if you think about code being nested, you start off with like your file, and then you have functions and functions within functions. Um, so this allows you to choose which level you're at. This is the top level is like your, your file. And this, the bottom level is like um, internal R code that like you probably will not <laughs> want to use. Um, so like, let's say I do go into one of these lower levels, like I, I, I choose which level I want and I say like, I want level six. It'll bring me to the code that it's, breaking on and I'm like I have no idea what to do with this <laughs> right this is like not not helpful so instead I'm like okay maybe I want to go into the level this is the level of my function called error my function sorry my function called foo at level at line 12 of my my file 
And here, this is where I'm like, oh, I can say X. I can print out at the big, my first line was like, I defined some um, variable called Y um, and that's helpful. Versus if I went into a, a top, a higher level, let's say I wanted to instead go into level four, which is like higher up in my code. It highlights, it's at this line. So this line, I, I have defined X, so I can look at what X is, right? but I, I don't know what Y is, it doesn't exist because I haven't defined it yet. So choosing the right level is really helpful. Um, so here the right level is this, I can print X. Salutation does not exist yet, right? Because it broke before it got there. And then there's a few, um, these uh, tools. So next um, says like execute the next line of code. Um, this allows you to go inside of a function. Um, this allows you to um, finish out a for loop, but like not go beyond it. And then continue says like, just keep going until you break. Um, so this, these are more, well, sorry, this is, so now it like broke even farther down. And so it's like, I've already like aired out. So this is like not very um, helpful, but um, this is these, these, those tools are, are a lot more helpful when you've like sort of determined a pre predetermined um, set point where you're like, I want to go into debug mode here. You can like add, um, you can add like a browser command. And then it'll automatically like start debug mode when you hit this line instead of like when you hit the error. So it's so like here, like Y exists, um, X already exists, but I haven't like errored yet. And then if I hit continue, then I hit the next line and it, and it errors. Um, so that's all I want to talk about for debugging. I have one, one final topic, which is, um, Profiling. So profiling is um, a way of um, determining where your code is inefficient, either slow or um, use up a lot of memory. So you start the profile and then you run whatever code you want to run. Um, so right now I'm running a cross validation script that I ran and it's a little bit slow. So I'm just going to have to give it a minute to finish. Hopefully it's not too terribly slow. I think it's slower when I'm running Zoom than when I was not running Zoom. <laughs> so hopefully um, this finishes quickly. There we go. Oh, it had an error, but that's okay. I hit stop profiling when I'm done and it automatically comes up with, it's, it's rendering this report, it just takes a minute. Um, so it tells me for every line how much memory and time it took. Um, so I can scroll through and look up like which lines were really slow or not. One thing that just makes it easier, I can hide code with zero time. So like, I don't really care about the really fast code. I just want to look at the really slow code. And so it tells me like, the, it tells me the, the how far it's indented is like how nested it is, right? So this is like top level code and then this is inside functions. And then it tells me, hey, like this is, these are the slow bits of your code. Um, of course it's, it's all nested, right? So like this is my top level function, but then within my top level function, like this is the slowest part of that, that function. And within that function, like this is, so you can kind of like get to like trace back to sort of the lowest level. But it's, this is really useful if you're trying to like figure out like, why is my code so slow? Like, what are the specific points that are the worst? Um, and you can also look at memory. And it, and it also gives you just like an overall estimate of how long it took. So if you like change something and then run it again, you know, you can get an easy estimate. Of course, there's other ways to get um, time estimates, um, th but this is the most efficient way to really like figure out where the choke points are. And let me go back to my presentation. Okay, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Um, I have some references here, so they're available um, online. And then um, I just wanted to like give a tiny bit about me because um, I know for the questions, I'm happy to create questions about the presentation, but I'm also happy to take any questions um, about my experience. 
Um, so um, Nagma already kind of introduced me, um, so I don't have a lot more to say. Um, I've worked in industry, I've mostly been in academia. Um, I'm starting a faculty position soon. Um, I recently released my first um, CRAN package, which I'm pretty excited about. It's very specific though. Um, it is for calculating um, statistical power for randomized experiments. Um, so most likely none of you <laughs> will ever want to use it, but if you do, um, it's a really helpful package. And then um, I encourage you all to connect with me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn, your, your favorite um, profile. So, and I will put my contact information in the chat as well. So, um, thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. Thanks for your great presentations. Thank you. And if anyone have a question, can raise the hand and ask a question. Um, how do you determine the number of hidden layers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that is, again, something that you would probably figure out with cross-validation, um, although it's going to be very slow. <laughs> so this is the problem with neural networks, is that when you do cross-validation, basically you fit a neural network like hundreds of times and you compare like what is my predictive accuracy when I fit it with one hidden layer? What is my predictive accuracy when I fit it with two hidden layers? Um, so you kind of give it a range of, of values of like how many hidden layers you might want. Um, and there are often sort of rules of thumb about how many hidden layers and how many nodes that you have. So for example, for nodes, you usually don't have more nodes than variables. So if you only have five variables, you probably don't need a hundred nodes um, and you probably don't need like a lot of layers either. Um, I actually don't know the sort of like guidelines for how many hidden layers you might need. Um, that's more of a like deep learning topic, uh, but I'm guessing there are sort of like general rough places you start and then usually you do like cross validation to figure out um, what, what number of hidden layers um, it gives you the best accuracy. And I have a question uh, about the data uh, distributions. You mentioned in the uh, your talk in the, that uh, you we should be normalized data. Uh, but uh, what about the others distribution of data set like gamma, Poisson, or others? Uh, is it, is it uh, my first question? Is that is it important that uh, know uh, our data distribution in the uh, neutral uh, network? No, it's actually, um, it's really, the nice thing about neural networks is because they're so flexible, it figures out the distribution for you, right? So like you're thinking about like regression where you're like, oh, I have to tell it, like I have Poisson, I have Gamma, whatever. Um, but like, because it has a very, and that's because regression has such a very restrictive model, right? Like mm -hmm. it's only gonna fit a very specific linear line. And if you get it wrong, it's gonna like look really bad versus neural networks, it kind of like figures out all that out by itself. Um, so that's like, that's really cool. Like it's, it's really, really cool and also really dangerous <laughs> because like one of my like challenges with neural networks is that it like doesn't really force you to think about your data or look at it as much versus like in regression, you like check all these assumptions and you like, you know, you have like, you often have preconceived notions about like what you're going to see. Like you're like, oh, there should be like a positive relationship here or something like that versus like neural networks, you don't get any of that. And so like, if there's like a problem, you won't necessarily notice it. Um, but like, it's also super powerful. So if you do have like some super crazy data that's like a Poisson mixture of gammas or something, it's like just gonna figure all that out for you and you, you don't have to really like think about it too hard. Thank you. Thank Great you question. for your explanation. Yeah. Okay. What is the best book about deep learning in R? Ooh, I actually don't know. Um, so I wanna clarify that like, this is not my research area at all. <laughs> um, I uh, am like not, I don't really like do machine learning or, or deep learning or anything like that. Um, I chose this topic partly to learn about it myself <laughs> and also partly because um, I feel like it's often easier to learn from someone who also doesn't know as much because people who know too much are like, skip over the basics and just assume you know a lot of things. Um, so I actually like 
uh, don't know a lot of like more information. Like there's just such uh, like the problem with deep learning is that it's like changing every five minutes, right? Like people are like actively doing research on it all the time. Um, and so I, I don't really know about like the, the latest stuff going on in the field, um, but good question. <laughs> if anybody has any recommendations, um, feel free. <laughs> How can a question you have a question about overfitting how can we find the best place to stop training um so the it's a good question of like how you balance it and it just like the way that you do that is just to make sure that um your performance is good on your test set so really that's like your your metric to decide like how well what you, how well your model is doing is you always look at how well it is doing on the test set. There are a bunch of different um, metrics you can use to evaluate your model, depending on whether it's categorical or regression. It's like, again, this is a whole area all by itself. There's, um, if you have binary data, you can look at ROC curves, you can look at mean squared error, you can look at accuracy. There's just like all these people, Breyer scores, people come up with like all these different basically calculations for um, model like performance, how well your model is doing. And so you want to choose, you know, a couple of them that are more specific to whatever context you're in. Um, and then you pick, like, you can try, for example, a more complicated model and a less complicated model, and then compare the two and say, like, which one performed better on my test set. Because um, most likely the complicated model will perform better on your test set, but you want to make sure that it's actually worth it and still performs um, well on your test set. Uh, yeah, so sorry, that's like kind of a vague answer, but um, the problem is it is really like context, it's, it, it depends on like the structure of your data and it also depends on your goals. Um, so for example, sometimes you care more about like false positives and sometimes you care more about false negatives. Um, so you wanna like optimize for whatever you're predicting. Like sometimes it's like better to like accidentally predict success um, or like predict too high of a number than to predict too low of a number. Um, so yeah, that was a long answer. Glad that you have a recommendation for the deep learning book. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> That's good. Uh, and uh, which one is better, cross-validation or simulated data set, use simulated data set or uh, use the some criteria such as archaic or base criteria to uh, compare the model or say about the fit model? Which one is better? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of the sort of more statistical criteria like um, Akiki you were talking about or like AIC, BSE, I don't think those really apply to neural networks very well because they assume that you know the distribution of the data. Um, and here we like don't assume that at all. Um, and so I think they don't really like translate very well. Um, cross validation is great because like it works no matter what, right? Like there's no, there's basically like zero assumptions that are going into cross validation. Um, you also mentioned simulated data. I think that I would probably prefer cross validation over simulated data just because the problem with simulations is that you have to like, it only like is, works well if you like really really understand your data and like really simulate everything properly i think it gets a little bit it like it, if you like accidentally mess that up and like forgot to include some structure or something that exists in your data it might give you like, inaccurate results so i, I think cross-validation is usually the best but then there's all these different types of cross-validation right like leave one out cross-validation k-fold cross-validation i don't know i don't really know which ones are best i think that's still kind of an open question mm -hmm. Thank you.